just a little bit longer. We are going to go back to our study in Galatians that we had a two-month break from. We're up to Galatians chapter 5, so two chapters left in this letter of Paul's. That As we're going to see today, he's going back to a theme as we read this text together, and then we'll pray and you can be seated. We're going back to a, a theme that really is big, not just in the book of Galatians, but all the way through the scripture, Genesis to Revelation. It's this picture of the bondage to slavery and the deliverance that from Genesis was pointed forward to and now that we and and even the letter to the church of Galatia looking back to the freedom Jesus came to give his people. There's a rescue. So we read from Galatians chapter 5. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm therefore and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Look. Look. I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. You are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. Our Father, we need uh, your word every day. We look for all, all sorts of extra clues on how to live our lives. Uh, we live on whims and spiritual sounding platitudes. Ultimately, they come up dry. But as we hear from you, this is... This is a well that never runs dry. This is our, our final source of authority for what we believe and for how we live. So give us hope on these pages today. Stir us, wake us up, show us our sin, but show us our sin in the light of what Jesus died to set sinners free. In his name we come, amen. Please be seated. You may never have heard of Isaac Johnson, but I'm going to tell you a little bit of his story Isaac uh, wrote a letter. He was born a slave. And he is telling his story. He actually wrote a a short book. A a very sharp man whom God delivered from slavery. And so I'm going to go through some of the words he wrote about his years in slavery. And then about his attitude after he had come out of that and actually had an encounter once again with his master. He said, during the year 1859, Master had gathered on the stock farm 120 Negroes and all but 10 were taken away to market. Now, if I pause for a moment, that might not mean a whole lot to you and me, but taken away to market was was one of the biggest evils of the slavery system that existed in our country because people were sold like cattle and families were, were split up And it meant nothing to a lot of the slave owners. 
He says these were taken away in the same manner as others had been, and all were sold except two who were brought back to the farm in the spring of 1860. And during the summer, he gathered about 80 more. After the crops were in and harvested, these 80 slaves were taken to market. But in the meantime, Abraham Lincoln, God bless his memory, had been elected president. There was no market for the Negroes, and they were brought back to the farm in the spring of 1861. The war had commenced by this time, and slave property was at a discount, and he bought no more. It was then freely talked among the slaves that we would soon all be free. Next, the Yankee soldiers began to appear in the state, and I concluded, now is the time to make a break for liberty. And so he escaped. But he didn't go far. He ran away. He wasn't legally emancipated. He was a runaway slave, and because of the Fugitive Slave Act, he was able to, to be extradited from wherever he was because it was federal law that, that uh, you had to go back to your master. He describes meeting his master again. I was at the mill that day and saw them. I made a bargain with one of the men to go and cook for his captain. That night after my work was done, I started and about one o'clock I overtook the train. The guard halted me. I said I was a friend and he told me, Advance, friend, and give the countersign. I advanced, but I had no countersign. When he wished to know what I was doing there that time of night, I told him I had hired with one of the men to come and cook for his captain. He told me if that was so, it was all right. He took me to the wagons. I'll move down in the story. I was 18 years of age. We lay in a camp for a few weeks and then went to Green River. While at this place, I had a letter written to Rosa telling her of my good fortune, but the master got the letter. He, with a Negro driver, soon started for, for the camp. I saw them while I was by a brook, washing some clothes for my captain. I mistrusted they were after me and hid near the road where I remained till I saw them go away. Then I took the clothes to my tent. The captain came and asked, Isaac, what are you looking so downhearted for? I said, nothing in particular. He then said, oh, oh yes, Isaac, there is something wrong. He answered, I suppose you saw your master. I said, I did, but he didn't see me. The, I'm going someplace with this, by the way. In, in this account, here is a man who, by all accounts, has escaped and he's free, and yet he's still in bondage to this man who's lived so far away and just the very sight of him has caused him to be downcast. His new employer gave him a handgun. And he said, I felt like a real man, I felt free, and yet the specter of his former master was still over him. After the war, after the Emancipation Proclamation, after the slaves were free, he actually went back to the plantation. And here's later in his book, years later, he went to see his old master, not because he liked him. Master was apparently glad to see me. He said I was the first to leave him and the first to return. With the old-time southern hospitality, he set to the cellar, sent to the cellar for something to drink, and I was made welcome to the best in his house. I could not help but notice the change. There were two ex-Confederates in the room who did not look upon me very kindly, if I read them aright. Listen to this. Master offered me good wages if I would only return and remain while he lived. But I knew him too well to think of it seriously. This is not a Bible theme. This is the Bible theme, friends. When people talk about what the gospel is, if you ask a hundred professing Christians, what is the gospel? It's a little disturbing that less than a majority of them at least in my experience, would be able to explain to you biblically what the gospel is. And then you take the next step and you say, well, what does the gospel do? Let's put it simply in biblical terms, as the Apostle Paul did in 1 Corinthians. As a matter of first importance, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried. He rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Everything else in the Christian life is based on your faith in that. You say, well, I, I acknowledge that as a historic event. But see, the life of a free person is what happens 
with the gospel. The life of somebody not who says, good, now I can live however I want. That's not freedom, that's slavery. The life that comes out of this is the life that says, I don't have to go back there. My old master, remember Pharaoh? Yeah, you guys can go. But don't go too far. The old master wanted them back because that's what slave masters do. The world, the flesh, and the devil miss what belongs to them. If you look through the scriptures and you see all that has been, uh, well, all that has happened in the history of redemption, you realize this isn't just a theme, it's the theme. I want you to go to, Galat- to uh, Luke chapter 4 before we go back to Galatians 5. So put a marker here in Galatians. I'm trying to make the case that what I am saying is accurate biblically. That the Lord Jesus came to deliver people from slavery. That the picture of the Passover is not, is not something other than what was fulfilled in Christ. That was the menu, that was the shadow, and we have found the meal, and we found the substance of the shadow, the shadow caster in Jesus. In Luke chapter 4, you have the Lord Jesus at the very start of his ministry getting uh, tempted by the devil in the wilderness. He was tempted with the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of what we have and do. Having gone through that without sin, The Lord Jesus began his ministry. And there were a number of things that happened at the start. A lot of you remember the first miracle Jesus did uh, was turning the water into wine in a wedding at Canaan of Galilee. But he also, on the Sabbath, was teaching in the synagogues. And this particular account in Luke chapter 4 may have been the very first sermon Jesus delivered during his ministry. And he's in what we'd call his home church. He's there. uh, Probably Joseph wasn't around anymore. We really hear no more of him after Jesus was 12. But it's possible that Mary is there and that Jesus' sisters and brothers, he, there were a lot of children Mary and Joseph had after Jesus. The people of the community, they watched him grow up. This is not just the carpenter's son. This is the carpenter. And now he's in a position where he's reading from the Isaiah scroll right in front of all of them. And he's there to give the sermon. I, I well know what it would be like to grow up and somebody says, well, you're, you're a man of the cloth. No, you're a preacher, 18 years old. Come and preach to us. So here's the Lord Jesus at around 30 years old preaching in his home congregation. Luke chapter 4, I'm going to begin at verse 14. Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and a report about him went out through all the surrounding country. He taught in all their synagogues, being glorified by all, and he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say that to them. It it stirs me every time I read this, as the Lord Jesus is saying, this is the mission. He began to say to them, which means this was the start of the sermon. The text was read. Jesus, the expositor, the applier, the author of scriptures says, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. I came to release captives I came to emancipate slaves. So when we start into this text in Galatians chapter 5, and he says that the ESV is what we're using through this series, for freedom Christ has set us free. One good question to ask is this, free from what? From what did Jesus come to set his people free? We can't say that everybody in the world is free. 
in, in the sense that Paul's talking about here, right? When he talks about us here, this is the saints of Galatia. This is the believing people. But those who have embraced this gospel in a personal way, they've turned from their sins to Jesus. They are the ones to whom Paul writes, you know why Christ set us free? He set us free for freedom. So when you say free from what? We can say, well, first of all, you look through the Scripture. He freed us from the future penalty of sin, right? How do we, how do we get around this? Jesus took wrath that sinners deserved. Everyone who, can believe, who, who believes, who's been brought to faith in Christ, can say, Jesus took the Father's wrath for me. He endured it so I don't have to. That's freedom. Freedom from the present power of sin. Kind of like our friend Isaac in the story went back. And by the way, this is a man who had come to faith in Christ and who observed even, even slave owners in the South. There were slave owners in the South who were followers of Christ and he made observations about how the Christians cared for the slaves compared to those who just claim to be Christians in the way they treated their slaves. Isaac realized, finally, that he didn't need to be afraid of his old master anymore. The power was gone. Now the old master is going to keep inviting him to come back in, right? Give you good wages, I'll take care of you, man. Have you lived there? Have you lived there where there were things that bound you before? And, and always knocking on your door, always ringing the doorbell. Saying, come on, you're mine. You're mine. You're not one of them. You're mine. You know, really, you can just say, Lord, would you get that? Because Jesus took that. I got a new master now. So there is no more power over my sin. I am free from that. For that matter, free, freedom from slavery to sin Freedom from slavery, and this is the harder one because some of us were the good kid. We were the compliant child. We're the church-going child. Just tell me what to do, and I'll do it. And for parents, honestly, those kids are pretty easy to raise. It's like, wow, just okay. Yeah, you do what you're told. And yet, isn't it true, if you were that kid, sometimes the, the nastiest snake in your life is comparing yourself to the rioters or comparing yourself to that dirty cop in Minneapolis comparing yourself to the nasty people in the community and feeling a real sense of accomplishment that you would never do that. And yet you see the Lord Jesus going after people and telling the self-righteous people, you're blind too. Because you say you can see and you have all the answers, you're blind too. There's a slavery to the legalism that Galatians attacks. Remember, there is a, a whole letter here in the Scriptures inspired by the Holy Spirit attacking legalism attacking this desire to be the good kid and to look good to everyone else. And it's a, a cross-crushing self-righteousness. That's freedom. So we'll, we'll look through this text and you see verse 1, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm therefore and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Let me paraphrase this. Christ set us free so we could be free. There's a good thing about freedom. And we, we tend to think that uh, it's just so we can do what we please. I spoke with a pastor and, and, uh, who, uh, who celebrates the, the right to, to carry a concealed weapon. I said, you, you do that on the pulpit too? He said, yeah. I said, why? He said, because I can. Well, you could take that attitude in a couple of different directions. But the truth is, Rather than, why are you sinning? Because I can. That, that would not be a picture of freedom, right? But to say, why are you going above and beyond for the people around you? Why have you turned from that old life? And you don't do the stuff you used to do. In fact, you're doing other things instead. And you're so religious. Or you're such a stick in the mud. Why do you do that? How about this? Because I can. Because I've been set free. I'm not a slave anymore. Jesus died to free us from the future penalty of sin and the present power of sin and from slavery to our sin, from slavery to works-based righteousness. The death of Jesus 
freed slaves and calls them to identify as free. I am free. You know, prideful perfectionism and self-righteousness also put people in chains. Either you are a slave to the pride of achievement or you're a slave to the despair of your failures. And Jesus delivered believers out of both ends of this because he's the only perfect performer. He's, he's the one who lived up to it. By the way, in looking at that, that, those two words in English, stand firm, it's actually one word that's used in the New Testament. It's used very often of actually standing up, literally standing. But metaphorically here, right, it's, it's like a position. If you ask a politician, what's your stance on the sanctity of human life? What's, what's your stance on uh, race relations? What's your stance on taxes? We're using it that way. What's your position? Do you maintain your position? So when he talks about standing firm, he's talking about maintaining a position. Who am I in Christ? This letter talks so much about identity. I want you to picture an accuser of an emancipated slave charging that this free man or free woman ought to go back to the plantation. How can a freed slave stand his ground, stand her ground? The reason they can do that is because the price was paid for their freedom. There's been a, there's been a legal transaction. It's done. You're not just a runaway trying in your own strength to get away from the plantation. You are free. And that's what Paul's saying. You're free. Why do you people, giving at the context of Galatians, you had Jews and Gentiles alike in this church? And there were people, this, this was about more than just saying, okay, you Gentiles have to go undergo ritual circumcision. I don't think that you can read Galatians slowly and carefully without considering this. Ritual circumcision was only a, a part of what these people were demanding. They said, you need to convert completely. You need to become outwardly, outwardly Torah observant in every way like national Israel was. And this is what Paul is attacking. He's using circumcision as, as the illustration because that was the starting point in entering into that national covenant that Israel had. So that helps us understand why it appears that Paul's attacking circumcision. He wasn't against it. If you read Acts chapter 16, you find out that he, he actually said, you know, Timothy, I know you're, you're, you haven't undergone the ritual conversion. You're... you're mother and grandmother are Jewish, you have that heritage, your father's a Gentile, because it might be controversial, we, we think that you ought to go ahead and undergo circumcision. Paul wasn't against it. The issue in the book of Galatians is people who were calling others to, to this position saying you won't truly be sanctified, you can't truly be right with God unless you are towing the mark right down the line with, with all of these ceremonial laws and the other laws and that doesn't by the way mean that that the the law of god the moral laws of god in the scriptures are of no account to us in fact they're all repeated in the the new testament scriptures you are standing firm back to verse one as a freed slave you're standing firm because jesus died to rescue you from this works-based existence that you have that word again, by the way, in this text, do not submit again to a yoke of slavery, it reminded the Jews in the church and the Gentiles in the church of Galatia that some people who've been set free might still get sucked back into at least some parts of the old life. Don't go back there. Don't go back there. Like, like Isaac went, went back into home territory. We don't know for sure why he went back from his words, it sounds like he was just saying, I just wanted to, to see what the old life, life was like so I could be thankful for what I have now. But you saw what happened when he went back. The old master said, come on, I'll take, I'll take good care of you. And what did he say? I, I knew him too well to listen to that. The warning is this, friends. Whether it was sins of the flesh that bound you or the, the 
fleshly sin of being the good kid that bound you and kept you from faith in Christ, kept you from seeing your need for repentance. The call here is this, don't go back. You don't want to go back there. You don't want to go back to your old master as loudly as the old master calls. So Paul said this, Look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. So we need to talk about that a little bit because there are some who say, see, what Jesus did on the cross is totally dependent on on what we do in response. Let's look at this as he's saying it, because I don't think that's what he's saying. Paul may have uh, used this, well, the construction is not just I, Paul, but I, Paul, myself. In other words, pay attention. I'm the one who's writing these things. Remember who I am. Hebrew of the Hebrews, tribe of Benjamin, circumcised the eighth day. Uh, As far as the law was concerned, a Pharisee. This is the strict Jew, Paul, who's writing to you. And I'm telling you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. Of all people, Paul, who as we learned was not opposed to circumcision, warned of the serious error, not of the ritual, the serious error of getting sucked into self-righteous, works-based salvation. To say that Christ would be, quote, of no advantage or no profit, some of your translations might say. To say that was to say that the death of Christ means nothing if our efforts can bring us nearer to God, right? Think about the debtor mentality that some people have. It's like, well, Jesus paid for my sin, so I'm just going to live my life to pay him back. Please reevaluate that if that's been your attitude. It's not paying it back any more than you ask your parents how much they spent for your Christmas presents. You say, I'll do my best to pay you back. That's not the response God calls out from us. There's no way you and I can pay that debt. That's why Jesus had to die for us. And if there was some way we could pay it back, Jesus needn't have died. That's why he says Christ will be of no advantage to you. If you go down this road of legalism, of Phariseeism, of of self-righteousness, if you go down that road, you don't need Jesus. You think you can make it on your own. It really is like a slave refusing the offer of freedom to return to his former master saying, I'm just going to earn my way out. I'm going to earn my way out of this. Paul said, I, I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision. Now remember the context. Paul was not anti-circumcision. But he's talking about accepting it as, I'm, I'm taking in this, this whole life. I have to become Jewish. I have to become this way. And, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump in and we're just going to totally change our, our diet. We're going to change our lifestyle and everything because that's, that's an assumed. That's what this demands. Paul is talking more about more than just the right of circumcision. He says, if you go down that road, you're obligated to keep the whole law. In other words, not that it was wrong to abstain from eating pork, not that it was wrong to, to observe a Saturday Sabbath, not that it was wrong, you know, you go right down the line and see all of the 16, uh, 613 commandments of the Old Testament. It wasn't that it was wrong to do that. What was wrong in the book of Galatians was resting your hope for salvation, for that matter, for sanctification on your outward behavior. It is like a slave refusing the offer of freedom to return to his former master. And so he says, he's actually repeating himself about accepting circumcision. Conversion to the form of Judaism that Paul is attacking here started with that circumcision, but it needed to end in full compliance. You're going to have to do it all. By the way, there people... I think miss, uh, in reading the scriptures, they miss the fact that there was a great joy inside of national Israel for a lot of people to, to observe the, the law of Moses. It wasn't a drudgery for people who believed. They're, they were just saying, hey, I'm a part of this nation and God made a covenant, a national covenant with this nation. And so there were people who had a genuine relationship with Christ. In fact, uh, 
I would say that they were born again. I sat on an ordination council a couple of weeks ago and I asked the young man who was the candidate, was Abraham born again? And uh, I didn't give him the answer. But when we look at scriptures, remember the Lord Jesus in talking to Nicodemus, who was a, a Hebrew scholar, Jesus was surprised that Nicodemus didn't get the importance of this one-on-one -on -one relationship with a God that comes through a new birth. Your birth into the family of Abraham was great. You're circumcised, you're outwardly identified, but Nicodemus, that isn't it. That isn't the end. That's the picture. You need to be born from above. You need to be born anew. Nicodemus, your circumcision doesn't benefit you in any way. So there were people within national Israel who were sons and daughters of Abraham who for love of the living God kept the law. But there were plenty of others and Jesus had to deal with them over and over again. There were plenty of others who set their hope for eternal life on rule keeping, who compared themselves to others favorably. Should have been a delightful experience for an Old Testament saint, but as a means of salvation, it was and still is slavery. As a means of sanctification, of, of walking right with God, it is slavery. Paul said all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. You and I don't want to go back there. Sterner words in verse 4, you are severed from Christ you are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. You have fallen away from grace. To fall from grace, you've probably heard that terminology. We, we talk about a fallen politician or other public official who has fallen out of favor. We say, well, he, he fell from grace. The word grace does mean favor. What's Paul talking about here? I think, in looking at this text, that falling from grace is to turn from all the advantages that are offered in the gospel. There's stuff I can do. There's stuff I can do. I can handle this. And whether we realize it or not, even if we give lip service to salvation by grace through faith, isn't it a, a, an insidious thing that creeps up within us? This pride that brings us to say, I can handle this. I can keep the rules now. I'm pretty good. This really is a warning that people with all the advantages of gospel truth cut themselves off from its benefits when they turn back to the slavery of legalism, of living, living by rules and finding their joy in that. It really would be the same illogical reasoning if a, a starving person refused a meal. They've, they've fallen from what will sustain them. He's saying, don't turn back. He gives us the alternative here, by the way, through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. I sent out Table Talk uh, earlier this week. I guess it was on Tuesday. It came out this week. And I asked a question about verse 5 in that. Maybe some of you had the chance to, to review that and think about it. What really is the alternative to through the Spirit by faith, eagerly waiting for the hope of righteousness? This through the Spirit by faith. What's the opposite? Well, it would be by the flesh, and by works. Isn't this the whole thing Paul's arguing about in this book of Galatians? You are either saved by a work of the Spirit of God and, and He brought you to believe, or you are saved by the things that you do, that you work up within you, that whatever you can conceive, you can achieve. The alternative to a hope that springs from the Spirit and faith if, you're, if your hope rests in your ability to rise up and conquer your own sins, if it rests in your ability, kind of like Moses saying, I know how we're going to get out of Egypt. And he killed a slave, owner, a slave driver. And God sent him into the wilderness for 40 years. That wasn't the way. If your hope rests in your ability to rise up and conquer your own sins, then your hope is resting on a very shaky foundation. So you trust in the work of Jesus. You trust in the work of the Holy Spirit. And that brings you to set your hope on what only God can do. So we pause here for a moment. I'm going to get to application shortly. But, but 
to think about the sin that has plagued you. And for, for most of you, it, it's not always something that comes outwardly. It's an attitude. It's an attitude of disobedience toward God, an attitude of discontent to, to, toward God or to others in your family, to your spouse, to your employer, to your siblings, your parents, your children. There, there's this, this cussedness about us. We're, we're uneasy and it bothers our conscience because we've done wrong and we keep going back there over and over and over again. Maybe it's been years and we're despairing. How in the world are we going to get out of it? This is the hope for you. It's not a matter of saying, hey, I, I'm going to turn over a new leaf. Maybe, maybe there's going to be an altar call about people who are having trouble in their home or in their workplace. So God, uh, here it is. Here I am. I'm coming again to confess the same old sin. So... Put a spark in me so I don't have to live this way anymore. In Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. Paul didn't promote circumcision or uncircumcision. He said this, matters of the heart are what counts. I want you to remember that outward rites and please get this. Outward rights have never changed hearts. Think about the people that you have known in your lifetime who grew up maybe in whatever religious tradition it was. And they, they really thought that if they, maybe because of a choice their parents made for them or maybe classes that they attended or, or some outward right like baptism, they thought, hey, sins are gone, sins are washed away. I've done this. I think I'm good that attitude really does fit this text. In Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. I want you to remember that outward rights don't change hearts. Long before Jesus came to rescue sinners, and this is hopeful for us, right? Because some of us have grown up believing that in the Old Testament, people were saved one way, and then when Jesus came, we're, we're saved by faith. God has always had a remnant of his own people inside the, the people who obeyed the rules outwardly as a nation in Israel and people who were outside of the nation of Israel. God brought people under his wings from every tribe, tongue, and nation and has been from the beginning of time. But when you, when you look what God pointed out to Israel in the book of Deuteronomy at the end of the giving of the law, listen to what he said. The Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul that you may live. Do you, do you see what God is saying to national Israel? He's saying the point is not that you become outwardly a part of the nation. The point is that you have an inside change. If you're wondering why in the world you can't get past the sin that plagues you, maybe it's because your hope has been in the wrong place. You're just trying to get out of, of whatever it is by willpower. The biblical concept of Christian liberty has been defined in, in a, a large number of ways. And we're, we're going to talk about what freedom in Christ really does look like in the life of a believer. It's really hard to miss statements like the one we started out with. It's for freedom that Christ set us free. You remember Jesus teaching in the synagogue saying, hey, I came to bring this freedom and now here I am from Isaiah chapter 61. This, this literal slavery of national Israel that you saw in Egypt, the slavery that you saw when they were carried away into captiv captivity in Babylon, the many times through the years, even under King Solomon, where, where things started to go south and the people became uh, in bondage to, in one way or another to the nations around them. That outward slavery was a part of the nation of Israel in their history. And then the Lord Jesus came on the scene and not only preached these words in the synagogue that we read earlier, but the Lord Jesus is standing before a group of strict Jews and He said, if the Son sets you free, you shall be free indeed. You don't have to go back to that master. And you know what happened, right? 
a lot of the people like the woman at the well and, and like uh, some of the, the tax collectors and the, the sinners of the communities. And yeah, even some of the religious people realized, I need Jesus. I need Jesus. I need freedom that Jesus brings. And, and they bowed the knee. And yet, when Jesus said, if the Son sets you free, you shall be free indeed. What was the response of the religious people whose works-based righteousness was their pride? They said, we've never been slaves to anyone. And there you have the difference between a slave and a free person. It was voluntary slavery for these folks. And it has impacted everyone, just like the sin of Adam impacted the whole race of us. So, what did Jesus deliver us from? He rescued us from the world, from the flesh, from the devil. I'm free. I I have a, a new master. I sing a new song. Uh, there's, a, there's a new life that Jesus gave me, even if that came to me many years ago. Let's talk about what that freedom in Christ looks like before we finish this morning. The memory of slavery becomes your motivator. This, this book that I, I read a portion of by Isaac Johnson testifies to this. The memory of that slavery becomes your motivator. And here's the problem. In a group like this, in, in a, a conservative church, in a conservative county, and really what has been in some ways a Christian nation, even though I don't think we, can, we would have, have to call ourselves post-Christian now, but there is still a, a Christian influence that so many of us have had. And because of that, a lot of us have this feather in our cap. It's like, Christian, live here. Got that? that morality. I know of atheists who, because they've grown up here, live outwardly moral lives. And one of them wrote a book called, I Can Be Good Without God. But to remember, even those of you who've been outwardly good, to realize that there have been things that have bound you in your attitudes, you can't escape. There's nothing out, no, no way out for you. But when you come to Christ and you've been set free, you can't help but blush at the old life, whether that life was reckless abandon or strict, proud religiosity. Both of those things kept you a slave and their memory always pushes you to the cross, which is the next part of this. The cross of Christ then becomes your delight. The cross of Christ becomes your delight. We sing about it. We take the Lord's table together. Even, even when we baptize believers, as we're going to do in just a few weeks, uh, we're picturing this death of the old and this coming to life as Jesus rose from the dead. The cross of Christ, the gospel, becomes our joy. It means something special. It's not just, yeah, cross on the side of the church and you talk about Jesus. Yeah, I know Jesus died for my sins. Isn't it very different when you realize the price was paid for you? That you lived an old life and you've been rescued from that? This is your only way to freedom, friends. Don't ever get tired of hearing that the violence that was owed to you went on Jesus. The price is paid and you are free. That's what makes the cup and the bread a sweet thing for somebody who has come to follow Christ. And finally, this is what freedom looks like. Your culture. Trusting God, loving people. Two greatest commands, right? Love God, love people. Made in His image. It becomes life. It's the response of the gospel. It's what, it's what makes us uh, stirred up when we see injustice around us. And, and rather than being informed by our politics in these situations, we've, we're informed by a, a biblical conscience that says, this is wrong to do evil to people, and it's wrong to curse God. Trusting God and loving people becomes your culture. Have you ever heard someone say, hurt people hurt people? In other words, somebody who grows up in a, an abusive situation uh, very often turns into abuser themselves. And that, that may be a, a, a maxim that, that is true. That at least, generally speaking, that has happened to a lot of people Hurt people end up hurting people. But don't you know it's also true that free people end up freeing people? That people who really understand the gospel 
want other people to have the same freedom, even your neighbors and your co-workers and your family members who seem to have it all together without Jesus, don't you believe that? People need the Lord. And, and so aggressive missions, aggressive evangelism ought to be the right response to somebody who says, I was lost and now I'm found. We're going to sing a song in a, a little bit that, that really echoes the words to amazing grace in a different way. To be lost in darkest night, thinking you know the way and you, you've believed all the promises of sin and yet you realize ultimately in Jesus, he is all that you have. Let's pray. Our Father, we bless you for giving us your word, for giving us your word that gives us promises. And so many of us here have believed that promise, that Jesus died in the place of sinners, and that everyone who turns from their sins to him, that bowing the knee to King Jesus as their Lord and Savior, becomes changed and set free, emancipated. So bring the lost to believe this day through this message and bring the believing to live the life of one set free. Thank you for hope that you give us in your son. Amen. We are going to uh, come to the table of the Lord shortly, but I'm going to ask you to stand and sing first and we're going to prepare and I'll give you some special instructions on how we're going to do this. Would you stand and sing about our Savior? Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Loves 
my Savior lives, my Savior is always there for me. My God, He was, my God, He is, my God is always gonna be. My Savior loves, my Savior lives, my Savior is always there for me. My God, He was, my God, He is, my God is always gonna be. So I'll talk about the practical parts of what we're going to do in, in just a moment. Uh, it's, it's been a long time uh, as a congregation. We've never been able to, we've never had to go this long without communing together. And some people would say, well, you know, it doesn't have anything to do with your salvation. And I'll, I'll, I'm right behind you there. It doesn't, there's no salvation brought by the bread and the cup. And yet the Lord Jesus called us to do this together till he comes and we we have a special presence of God when the the church gathers even if our position isn't th the same as some about what exactly uh happens in in these elements we we realize that we are together in the presence of God remembering Jesus death and so this special blessing is something we ought to cherish even if it doesn't bring us forgiveness of sins it certainly is what some would call a means of grace it is a way that God reminds us, just as the preaching of the word is that means. God uses that means to draw us close to himself and to keep us, us close to himself. When we look at the New Testament calls to the church, in fact, the pattern beyond the command to do this, when you look at the New Testament pattern for communion, you see in Acts chapter 2, the people gladly received his word, meaning they responded to the gospel of Christ. So what we know, first of all, in leading up in Acts chapter 2 to, to who was going to take communion, they were people who had responded to the gospel. They were believers. They knew their sins were forgiven. And so if, you're, if you can't class yourself as a believer, as a follower of Christ, uh, we're inviting people to walk forward today and bring the elements back to their chairs and, and take those together. But if you're not sure where you stand with the Lord Jesus, it, it is an embarrassing thing, or at least shouldn't be in this setting, to, to let the cup and the bread pass by. If you go a little bit further into that verse in Acts chapter 2, it says those who gladly received his word were baptized. And while we're not going to keep anyone from the communion table and we're not asking for records, it is true that the New Testament pattern is for baptized believers. So as baptized believers, we have identified with one another We've identified with Jesus and his death and resurrection, and we've den identified with the other people uh, who believe that gospel message. And so we're going to, uh, after uh, a, a brief confession of faith and scripture reading, we're going to invite those of you who are going to come to the table. If, if you can, come down the center aisle uh, and the deacon's, uh, decided not to put arrows on the floor, X's, you guys have had enough of that. Um, so to, to come this, this way, so we'll flow of traffic and then you can go back out that direction to your seat and we'll take that together. So we'll try and do this in an orderly way. Hey, this is new to all of us guys. So, so um, be, be gracious during this time. We are remembering really what we've just been talking about everywhere in scripture, but particularly in the book of Galatians. So we would invite you, if you are walking with God and, and you're willing to take some time as we prepare for this, to prepare your heart uh, for coming to the table of the Lord, we would invite you to take that together. There is a, a confession of faith that we have taught children and adults in our congregation. It's called the New City Catechism. It's not our official church doctrinal statement. We, the London Baptist Confession is our statement. But there is a, a question, what is our only hope? in life and death. This points us to what Jesus did for us. And so as I ask the question, I would invite you to respond. What is our only hope in life and death? That we are not our own, but belong body and soul, both in life and death, to God and to our Savior, Jesus Christ. We're going to take some time to prepare ourselves. And, and while you are 
coming to, to get the elements and while you're in your seat, while the music plays before we take the bread and then take the cup and Tim is going to come and read scripture for us as well. But uh, we're going to have that, that quiet time before God to confess sins before him, to remember the cross, to thank him. Make this a worship time as we're preparing, as we're waiting in our seats when everybody has gone through. And then we will, um, we will take the bread and the cup together with some instruction. Let's do that now. Uh, in an orderly way, uh, we won't start one wing or another. Just, just come down the center aisle. It is interesting to me that as Pastor has spoke this morning and as we have, have talked and, and had our message and, and the different things that have been put on the screen and the different things that Pastor has spoken about that as I prepared to, to talk about communion this morning and our, our time together that I was um, prompted, I believe, by the Lord to talk about remembrance that I was uh, looking at earlier this week uh, at the idea of the exodus we find that Paul asks the Galatians, the Ephesians, a lot of the letters he wrote, he prompts the people he is writing to to remember. And he asks them to remember that they were dead in their trespasses and sins. If you go back to the Exodus, at the time of the Old Testament, when the, the, the story is told, the story of the Exodus is a story about the redemption of the slaves the Hebrew slave in Israel that were being kept in Egypt. This symbolizes the salvation through Jesus Christ that we know today. And redemption is the buying back or paying a price to free a slave. In the, in the Jewish um, religious observances, the calendar, the different feasts, all of them were prompted to cause the people of Israel to remember what their God had done. And so we have this idea of remembrance. And Jesus introduces at the Last Supper this idea that they remember him. 
and that they remember His death until He comes. Our redemption is what we're remembering. It's from the body, we're being redeemed from the bondage of sin. In 1 Peter 1.18, we see that, Paul, that Peter says, we were not redeemed with silver or gold. Rather, we were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ and that without spot or blemish. In Ephesians, Paul tells us, in Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of His grace. And catch this verb, He lavished this grace upon us. Lavished means to give more. It's not just a little bit of amount. He lavished us with His grace. He brought that upon us. So we come to this table because of His worthiness, not our own. And so we invite you to partake with us. If you are redeemed by this great Savior, if you are following Him and walking in obedience to Him, and as you've examined yourself today and looked at that. In 1 Corinthians 11, we read the account that Paul gave of this. And we start at verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night He was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We need this time as a church. Not just because we've been apart, but because we are a hungry people. This isn't the idea of a meal. It was in the last, last Supper that this was first done. And so we realize our need, our need of a Savior, the breaking of His body, the shedding of His blood. And we need to do this to proclaim His death until He comes, to realize our need, and to take time to examine ourselves, and finally to spend this time together as a church remembering our great Savior. And so as we take this, take the bread today, we take the cup, we do so in remembrance of our great Savior. Let's take the bread together. Heavenly Father, as we've considered today this broken body, your broken body that was given for us, by your stripes we are healed. We thank you. And as we remember, remembering your life blood, life blood spilled for us on the cross, you gave that for us that our sins would be forgiven as the shedding of blood your blood brought us redemption. We thank you and we praise you for that. And we honor and remember you. And we look forward to that great time in heaven when we will sit at your feet and together with you we will drink again of the wine. Thank you in Jesus' name.